The first topic that I am going to talk about that in this video is the Embedded Event Manager or EEM. Embedded Event Manager or EEM is a very flexible and powerful Cisco iOS tool. EEM also allows engineers to build software applets that can automate many tasks. EEM also drives some of its power from the fact that it enables you to build custom scripts using TCL. Scripts can automatically execute based on the output of an action or an event on a device. One of the main benefits of EEM is that it is all contained within the local device. There is no need to rely on an external scripting engine or monitoring devices in most cases. This figure illustrates some of the EEM event detectors and how they interact with the iOS subsystem. Don't forget, here only we want to review the EEM. We don't want to configure it. We don't want to talk about the detector, the detail of EEM. Only we want to introduce the EEM or embedded event manager in this video. All right, now let me to explain a little about the EEM applets. EEM applets are uh, composed of multiple building blocks. This video focuses on two of the primary building blocks that make up EEM applets, events and actions. EEM applets use a similar logic to the if-then statement used in some of the common programming language. For, for instance, if an event happens, then an action is taken. The following example illustrates a very common EEM applet that is monitoring syslog message on a router. This example shows an applet that is looking for a specific syslog message, stating that the loopback zero interface went down. The specific syslog message is matched using regular expressions. This is a very powerful and granular way of matching patterns. If this specific syslog pattern is matched an event, at least once, then the following action will be taken. Step 1. The loopback zero interface will be shut down and brought back because of shut down and no shut down. Look at here. Here we can see these actions. Action 1. This is the event. Event syslog pattern. This syslog pattern. And the first action is the CLI command of enable. Then uh, the config terminal command. After that interface loopback zero. Then shut down command. Then no shut down command. Actually, the loopback zero interface will be shut down and brought back up because of shut down and no shut down. And then the router will generate a syslog message that says I've fallen and I can't get up. Look at here. This is the next action. The action uh, of the syslog message. This is the message. An email message that includes the output of show interface loopback zero command will be sent to the network administrator. Here you can see the action seven. This is the IP address of the mail server and to this IP address, this is the, for example, IP address, this is the email address of the network administrator. And here we can see the other detail uh, of the email and the action that and the information that we should send. Okay, the detail is not important. Actually, we can see if we experience this event, we should do these actions. Okay, this is the EEM applet, uh, includes some events and also some, uh, for example, actions. Also remember to include uh, the enable and configure terminal command at the beginning of the action within an applet. This is necessary as the applet assumes the user is in exec mode, not privilege exec or config mode. In addition, if AAA command authorization is being used, it is important to include the event manager a session CLI username username command. Okay, otherwise the CLI command in the applet will fail. It is also good practice to use decimal labels similar to 1.0, 2.0, and so forth when building applets. As you can see here, we have action 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. Okay, this makes it possible to insert new actions between other actions in the future. For example, you could insert a 1.5 action between the 1.0 and 2.0 action. Remember that labels are parsed as strings, which means 10.0 would come after 1.0, not 9, uh, for example, 0. 
Based on the output of the debug event manager action CLI command, you can see the actions taking place when the applet is running. This example shows the applet being engaged when a user issues the shutdown command on the loopback zero interface. It also shows that an error occurred when trying to connect to the SMTP server to send the email to the administrator. This is because the SMTP or simple mail transfer protocol server being used for this test is not configured. Notice that because the dollar underline CLI underline result keyword was used in the configuration, the output will include the output of any CLI command that were issued in the applet. In this case, the output of the show interface loopback zero command will be included in the debugging and in the email message. As you can see here, this is the configuration of our uh, applet. Here, the, un the dollar sign and underline CLI underline result keyword was used in the configuration. Okay, because of that, the output will include the output of any CLI command that were issued in this applet. For troubleshooting purposes, using the debug event manager, all commands shows all the output uh, for the configured action while the applet is being executed. For instance, it shows the same output as shown uh, in the previous example, but includes more detail on all the other actions. To specifically troubleshoot the mail configuration and related error message in an EEM applet, the debug event manager action mail command is most useful as it filters out all the other debugging messages that are unnecessary when you are trying to troubleshoot the mail configuration. This allows the user to focus specifically on SMTP errors uh, and it means that here we have uh, different options for debugging event, event manager. Another very useful aspect of EM applets is that CLI patterns can be matched as an event. Okay, This means that when certain commands are entered into the router using the CLI, they can trigger an EM app event within, within an applet. Then the configured action can take place as a result of the CLI pattern being matched. This example uses another common EEM applet to match the CLI pattern, okay, write mem, like write memory, okay. When the applet is triggered, the following actions are invoked. First, the router generates a syslog message that says configuration file changed, TFTP backup is successful. Let me to review it, look at here. This is the event manager applet or EEM applet. The name is backup config and this is the event and here we have some actions. Event is a, the a pattern of write memory with any other characters in the CLI and after that we have multiple actions. The first action is enable command, the second action is configure terminal, the third is file a prompt quiet and then action four is the end action five is copying a startup config to the tftp server here we define the tftp server IP, ad ip address and then the file name this is the file name and after that the next command is the configure terminal and finally no file prompt quiet and here as you can see we will have one syslog a syslog message with the priority of informational means prior to six and after that message configuration file change tftp backup successful actually here we have two important action the rotor generate a syslog message that says configuration file change tftp backup successful and after that the startup uh, config file is copied to the uh, for example tftp server the file prompt a uh, quiet okay command disables the ios confirmation mechanisms that asks to confirm a user's action okay the priority and uh, facility of the syslog message can be changed to fit any environments alerting a structure for example here we use the informational there are multiple ways to call out a specific EEM environment values. The first example illustrates that it is possible for a user to use a single line to configure the mail environment and send message with CLI output result. Using the EEM environment variables shown in the second example, users can statically set different settings that can be called on from multiple actions instead of calling them out individually on a single line. Although it is possible to create custom names and values that are 
arbitrary and can be set to anything. It is a good practice to use common and descriptive variables. Okay, this table lists some of the email variables most commonly used in the EEM. Only you need to review it. It's not important for us to in this course that we will learn about the detail of EEM. Common EEM mail variables are include the, for example, EEM variable underscore or underline email underline server. This is description SMTP server IP address or DNS name. For example, this uh, you can can use 10.0.0.25 or, or for example the uh, dns name after that email to the email address to send email to for example this email email from email address of the sending party and email cc email address of the additional email receivers all right now let me to explain a little about the eem and also tcl scripts uh, using an eem applet to call tcl scripts is another ve very powerful aspects of EEM. Okay, this example shows how to manually execute an EEM applet that in turn execute a TCL script that is locally stored in the device's flash memory. It is important to understand that there are many different ways to use EEM and that manually triggers applets okay, are also very useful tool. This example shows an EEM script configured with the event known command. Look at here. We have the event manager applet ping. This is the name. And as you can see here, we have the event known. Okay. Which means there is no automatic event that the applet is monitoring. And this applet runs only when it is triggered manually. To manually run an EM applet, the event manager run applet name command must be used, as you can see here event manager run ping this is the name and here we can see this name and also here actually we don't have any event only we have the action it means that you should run it manually and after running it you will see the first action action 1.0 cli command enable action 1.1 cli command tcl sh flash uh, colon slash ping dot tcl actually it means that please run this a TCL and after that here we can see the result of this uh, for example TCL uh, script for reference this example okay displays a snippet for the exact content of the ping.tcl script used in this manually triggered EM applet okay to see the content of a TCL script that reside in flash memory issue the more command followed by the file location and file name here you can see more flash colon ping.tcl okay the more command can be used to view all other text based files stored in the local flash memory as well actually it means that now we have one em in this em em we don't have any predefined event okay but we have some actions when you run event manager run ping the name of the applet this applet will be run and here you can see for example we have a tcl a script okay and uh, as you can see in the eem it means uh, we say please run this tcl uh, script and uh, this tcl script for example has the ping command to this uh, for a uh, five ip address here you can see that we will send traffic or icmp echo and we will receive for example icmp reply from all of these uh, five uh, destination ip address there are many ways to use EEM from applets to scripting. The possible use case can only be limited by an engineer's imagination. EEM provides unbox monitoring of various different components based on a series of events. Once an event is detected, an action can take place. This helps make network monitoring more proactive rather than reactive and can also reduce the load on the network and improve efficiency from the monitoring system because the devices can simply report when there is something wrong instead of continually asking the device if there is anything wrong. Many steps must be taken when onboarding new devices into a network environment. Often these steps are very time consuming and repetitive. This section compares the high level differences between agent-based and agentless automation and configuration management tools. Understanding how the various tools work can greatly help network operators pinpoint the value that each tool can bring to the table. There is a considerable amount of overlap in the tasks or steps various tools can 
automate. Some tools take similar approach. However, there are times when the use of multiple tools from different software vendors is appropriate. Much of the value in using automation and configuration management tools is in moving more quickly than is possible with manual configuration. In addition, automation helps, helps ensure that the level of risk due to the human error is significantly reduced through the use of proven and tested automation methods. A network operations team configuring thousand devices manually by logging into each device individually is likely to introduce misconfiguration and the process will be very time consuming. The following are some of the most common and repetitive configuration for which network operators leverage automation tools to increase speed and consistency. For example, configuring device name or IP address, quality of service, access list entries, username and password, SNMP setting and also a compliance features. All right, now let me to explain a little about the agent-based automation tools like the Puppet, Chef, and also Salt Stack. Actually, this section covers a number of agent-based tools as well as some of the key concepts to help network operators decide which tool best suits their environment and business use cases. Let me first start with the Puppet. You know that and you have learned about the Puppet in the CCNA a class, in the previous class, okay, that Puppet is a robust configuration management and automation tool. Cisco supports the use of Puppet on a variety of devices such as Catalyst Switch, Nexus Switch, and also Cisco Unified Computing System UCS server platforms. Puppet works with many different vendors and is one of the more commonly used tools used, uh, used for automation. Puppet can be used during the entire life cycle of a device, including initial deployment, configuration management, and also repurposing and removing devices in a network. Puppet uses the concept of a Puppet master or server to communicate with devices that have the Puppet agent or client installed locally on the device. Change and automation tasks are executed within the Puppet console and then shared between the Puppet master and Puppet agent. These changes are automation tasks are stored in the Puppet database or Puppet DB. Okay, and as you know, which can uh, this Puppet database can be located on the same Puppet master server or on a separate box. Okay, this allows the task to be saved so they can be pushed out to the Puppet agent at a later time. To help you better understand how Puppet function, you can use this figure. This figure illustrates the basic communication path between the Puppet master and the Puppet agent as well as the high level architecture. The solid line shows the primary communication path as you can see here, end user, master, and uh, this is the Puppet master. And after that here we have Puppet, uh, puppet agent. And also, as uh, you can see with high availability in the event that the master is unreachable, communication can go over the backup pass to the master replica. Actually, this is the backup master. Puppet allows for management and configuration of multiple device types at the same time. From a basic operation perspective, Puppet agent uh, communicate to the Puppet master by using different TCP connections. Each TCP port uniquely represents a communication path from an agent running on a device or node, and Puppet also has the capability to the periodically verify the configuration on devices. This can be set to any frequency that the network operation teams deems necessary. Then if a configuration is changed, it can be alerted uh, on as well as uh, automatically put back to the previous configuration. This help an organization uh, standards uh, its device configuration while simultaneously enforcing a specific set of parameters that may be critical to the devices. There are three different installation type with a puppet. Uh, in this table, we can see these three installation types of the puppet. Actually, this table describes the scale differences between the different installation 
options. As you can see, we have the installation type of monolithic, a scale up to 4,000 nodes, monolithic with compile masters, 4,000 to 20,000 nodes, and after that, monolithic with compile masters and standalone P. Uh, post GRE SQL more than 20,000 nodes. The typical and recommended type of deployment is a monolithic installation which support up to 4,000 nodes. However, with regard to deployment use cases, it is helpful to understand that Puppet can scale to very large environments. In this case, some best practices such as a high availability and centralized management may be considered important, although the architecture is very similar within large scale deployment operations staff may need a master of master or MOM to manage the distributed puppet master and their associated database. Having a, a MOM or master of masters greatly simplify the management of the environment. In addition, large deployment need compile masters which are simply load balance puppet servers that help scale the number of agents that can be managed. This figure shows a typical large-scale enterprise deployment model uh, of a puppet and uh, its associated uh, components. Let's now explore the structure of puppet. Puppet modules allow for the configuration of practically anything that can be configured manually. Modules contain the following component, manifests, templates, and also the files. Manifests are the code that configure the client or node running the puppet agent. These manifests are pushed to the device using SSL and require certificate to, in, to be installed to ensure the security of the uh, communication between the puppet master and also the puppet agent. Puppet has many modules available for many different vendors and device types. The focus in this video is on a module called Cisco Underline iOS, which contains multiple manifests and leverage SSH to connect to the devices. Each of these manifests is used to modify the running configuration on Cisco Catalyst device in some fashion. Manifest it can be saved as individual files and have a file extension of .pp. Okay, this example shows an example of a manifest file named ntp underline server okay dot pp that configure a network time protocol or ntp server on a cisco catalyst device here uh, actually this example shows that the dn uh, uh, that the ntp server ip address is configured as 1.2.3.4 and it uses vlan 40 2 as you can see as the source interface the line ensure present means that the NTP server configuration should be present in the uh, running okay uh, configuration of the catalyst iOS device on which the manifest is running remember that puppet can periodically run to ensure that there is a specific configuration present the NTP underline server that PP manifest can be run periodically to check for an NTP server uh, configuration puppet leverage a domain specific language or DSL as its programming language the next example shows a manifest file called MOTD.pp that is used to configure a message of the day or MOTD banner on Catalyst iOS uh, devices. All the modules and manifests used in this video can be found on the Puppet uh, Forge website, https colon slash slash forge.puppet.com. Puppet Forge is a community where Puppet modules, manifest, and code can be shared. There is no cost uh, to Puppet Forge, and it is a great place to get started with Puppet. Although this video does not discuss installation process, procedures, or system requirement, you can find that information at Puppet Forge, along with code examples and specifics on how to design and install a Puppet environment from scratch. Many of the same modules, manifest, and code can be also it can also be found on www.github.com by searching for a puppet. Now let me to explain a little about the next automation tool we call it Chef. Chef is an open source configuration management tool that is designed to automate configuration and operation of a network and server environment. Chef is written in Ruby and 
Erlang, but when it comes to actually writing code within Chef, Ruby is the language used. Configuration management tools function in uh, two different type of modules, push and pull. Push a model, push configuration from a centralized tool or management server while pull a model, check in with the server to see if there is any change in the configuration and if there is the remote device pull the updated configuration file down to the end device. Chef is similar to Puppet in several ways. For example, both have free open source versions available. Both have paid enterprise versions available. Both manage code that needs to be updated and stored. Both manage devices or nodes to be configured. Both leverage a pool model and both function as a client server model. However, Chef's structure, terminology and core component are different from those of Puppet. This figure illustrates the high-level architecture of Chef and the basic communication path between the various areas within the Chef environment. Although this video doesn't cover every component that you can see in this architecture, it is important to understand some of the elements that are, uh, for example, available. You can see uh, from this figure that Chef leverage a similar client-server functionality to Puppet. Although the core concept of Puppet and Chef are similar, the terminology differs. Whereas Puppet has uh, modules and manifest, Chef has cookbooks and recipes. Okay, and the, for example, uh, we have different term terminology in compared with the uh, Puppet. As you can see in this table, okay, we can compare the Chef component and also Puppet component. Actually, this table compares the component of Chef and Puppet and provide a brief description of each uh, component. Let me to review this table. As you can see here, we have Chef component and Puppet component. About the a Puppet component, we learned before, we have Puppet master and in the Chef component, we have the Chef server. This is the, for example, Chef server and description is the server or master function. About the um, Puppet, we had Puppet agent and here we have Chef client and it means that uh, this uh, is the client or agent function. About the Puppet component, we had module. Now here we have the uh, cookbooks. Uh, for example, here we have the cookbooks. And this is the collection of co uh, code or files. About the manifest, you know that each module contains some uh, manifest, okay? And here in the cookbook, we have some recipes. And this is the code being deployed to make configuration change. And also we had Puppet Console here now we have pop the chef workstation where users interact with configuration management tool and also create the codes code is created on the chef uh, workstation as i mentioned before and the code is stored in a file called a recipe okay as mentioned previously recipes in chef are analogous to manifest in puppet once a recipe is created on the workstation it must be uploaded to the chef server Okay, in order to be used in the environment. Okay, knife is the name of the command line tool used to upload work uh, the cookbooks to the chef server. Actually, with the help of this command line tool, we upload the uh, cookbooks uh, to the chef server. The command to execute and uh, upload is knife upload then cookbook name. The chef server can be hosted locally on the workstation, hosted remotely on a server, or hosted in the cloud. In addition, all the component can be within the same enterprise network. There are four types of Chef server deployments, Chef Solo, Chef Client and Server, Hosted Chef, and also Private Chef. About the Chef Solo, the Chef server is hosted locally on the workstation. And about the Chef Client and Server, this is a typical Chef deployment with the, uh, distributed components. About the Hosted Chef, the Chef server is hosted in the cloud, and about the Private Chef, all Chef components are within the same enterprise network. Like the Puppet Master, the Chef server sits in between the workstation and the node. All uh, cookbooks are stored on the Chef server and in addition to the cookbooks, the server holds all the tools necessary to transfer the node configuration to the Chef uh, client. 
OHI or OHAI, okay, a service that is installed on the node is used to collect the current state of a node to send to the, uh, for example, to send the information back to the chef server through the chef client service. The chef server then uh, checks to see if there is any new configuration that need to be on the node by comparing the information from the or high service to cookbook or recipe. The chef client service that runs on the node is responsible for all communication to the chef server and when a node needs a recipe, the chef client service handles the communication back to the chef server to signify the node's need for the updated configuration or recipe. Because the nodes can be unique or identical, the recipes can be the same or different for each, uh, for example, node. This example shows a recipe file constructed in Ruby. Recipe files have the file name extension .rb. Okay, you can see that the file is very simple to read and interpret. Okay, here for example we have cookbook name Cisco cookbook and then recipe demo underline install. As you can see, the reading of this uh, cookbook file is so easy. And after that, here we have uh, some laws. And here we have some uh, restriction rules and after that we can see the uh, chef rules okay and the, some comments that are so easy to understand after that here we have for example the BGP configuration and so on okay with chef the kitchen is a place where all recipes and cookbooks can automatically be executed and tested prior to hitting any production notes this is analogous to large companies in the food industry that use uh, test kitchens to make food recipes that will not interfere with other recipes in their production environment the kitchen allows for not only testing within the enterprise environment but also across many cloud providers and virtualization technologies the kitchen also support many of the common testing uh, frameworks as I mentioned before, the kitchen also supports many of the common testing frameworks that are used by the Ruby community. For example, Bash Automating Testing System or BATS and after that Minitest and then RSpec and finally Server Spec. Puppet and Chef are often seen as interchangeable because they are very similar. However, which one you use ultimately depends on the skill set and adoption processes of your network uh, operations. All right, now let me to explain about the salt stack agent and also server mode. Salt stack is another configuration management tool in the same category as Chef and Puppet. Of course, salt stack has its own unique terminology and architecture. We can say salt stack is built on Python and it has a Python interface so a user can program directly to salt stack by using Python code. However, most of the instruction or states that get sent out to the nodes are written in the YAML or a DSL. These are called salt formulas. Actually, formulas can be modified but are designed to work out of the box. Another key difference from Puppet and Chef is salt stack's overall architecture. Salt stack uses the concept of systems, which are divided into various categories. For example, whereas the Puppet architecture has a Puppet master and Puppet agent, Salt stack has masters and minions. As you can see here, we have Salt master and some Salt minion. Here we have Salt master, okay, or Salt stack master, and we have some Salt minions salt stack can run remote commands to a system in a parallel fashion which allows for very fast performance by default salt stack leverage a distributed messaging platform called zero m Q, as you can see here, 0MQ, for fast, reliable messaging throughout the networking stack. Salt stack is an event-driven technology that has component called reactors and beacons. A reactor lives on the master and listens for any type of change in the node or device that differs from the desired state or configuration. Actually, a reactor tries to find differences between the state or configuration between, the, for example, uh, the uh, minion and the server. This change include the following 
command line configuration change, disk or memory or processor utilization change, and also a status of services. Beacons live on minions, okay? The minions are similar to the puppet agent running on nodes. If a configuration change on a node, a beacon notifies the reactor on the master. Actually, first, the beacon should send the notification like a SNMP trap to the a, for example, a salt, st a salt stack master actually to the salt stack reactor, and after that, uh, this process called the remote execution system help determine whether the configuration is in the appropriate state on the minions. These actions are called jobs, and the executed jobs can be stored in an external database for future review or reuse. As you can see in this figure, we have the salt stack master and also some reactor re re residing, uh, residing the uh, master or salt stack master. And also we have the salt stack minions. And in salt stack minions, we have beacons. Okay, actually beacons should send the notify about the command line configuration, about the disk memory processor utilization, uh, for example, notification, and also about the status of a service. And if we find or, or in reactor uh, we can find some change okay the salt stack should react actually with the uh, cooperation of beacons and reactors we find that the status or the uh, configuration or the uh, for example configuration is same or are same between the salt stack master and also salt stack minions another notable difference between puppet and salt stack is that Instead of using modules and manifests to control state and send configuration change, salt stack uses pillars and grains. Salt stack grains are run on the minions to gather system information to report back to the master. This information is typically gathered by the salt minion diamond. This is analogous to a chef's use of the Ohio service. Okay, grains can provide specifics to the master on request about the host such as uptime for example pillars on the other hand store data that a minion can retrieve from the master pillars can also have certain minions assigned to them and other minions that are not assigned to a specific pillar would not have access to that data this means data can be stored for a specific node or, or set of nodes inside a pillar and it is completely separate from any other node that is not assigned to the to this particular pillar confidential or sensitive information that needs to be shared with only specific minions can be secured in this way in terms of overall scale and management salt stack much like puppet and chef can scale to a very large number of devices like puppet and chef salt stack also has an enterprise version and a gui or graphical user interface in this graphical user interface we call it syndic okay make it makes it possible to leverage the master of masters although this a video focuses more on the command line delivery of salt stack it is important to understand that these two like the others offer some very similar features this figure shows the overall architecture of the salt stack and its associated components again although the component in this architecture are not covered in this video it is important to understand some of the elements that are available like puppet salt stack has its own domain specific language or dsl the salt stack command structure contain targets commands and arguments the target is the desired system that the command should run it is possible to target the system by using the minion id of a minion or it is also very common to target all system with the asterisk which is a wild card indicating all system that are currently managed by salt by salt stack Another possibility is to use a combination of two, for example, minion uh, star or asterisk would grab any system that has a minion ID that starts with the word minion. This is called globing. The command structure uses the module.function syntax followed by the argument. An argument provides detail on the module and function that is being called uh, on the, on, in the command. Okay? This figure shows the correct salt syntax, uh, syntax as well. 
the power of running a command called cmd.run that execute the ad hoc Linux CLI command ls-l slash etc across all salt stack managed nodes and returning the output of the command to the master. Imagine that a network operations team is looking to deploy a new feature on the network and needs a list of all the IP addresses on all the Linux servers in the environment. The team could use cmd.run to achieve this. However, other commands and modules are specifically designed for such use cases rather than having to write up all the ad hoc commands necessary to get the desired output from all the nodes. The team could leverage something like the network.interface command to gather much more data from disparate systems such as the MAC address, interface names, states, and IPv4 and IPv6 addresses assigned to those interfaces. This figure provides an example of output on a Linux host showing the showing the specific use case salt stack can provide some immediate benefits especially for operations team that are used to working in the command line environment on network and server nodes a team can easily tie the power of python scripts into salt stack to create a very powerful combination other tools use python as well but which one to use ultimately comes down to what the operation staff is most comfortable with all right now let me to explain a little about the agentless automation tools first ansible ansible is an automation tool that is capable of automating cloud provisioning deployment of application and also configuration management actually ansible has been around for quite some time and uh, was catapulted further into the mainstream when red had purchased the company in 2015 ansible has grown very popular due to its simplicity and the fact that that is open source. Ansible was created with the following concept in mind, consistent, secure, highly reliable, and also minimal learning curve. Unlike the automation tool we learned previously in this video, Ansible is an agentless tool. This means that no software or agent need to be installed on the uh, client machines that are to be managed. Some consider this to be a major advantage of using Ansible compared to using other products. Ansible communicates using SSH for a majority of devices and it can support Windows remote management or WinRM and other transport methods to the clients it manages. In addition, Ansible doesn't need an administrative account on the client. It can use built-in authorization scalation such as sudo when it needs to raise the level of administrative control. Ansible sends all requests from a control station, which could be a laptop or a server sitting in a data center. The control station is the computer used to run Ansible and issue, change, and send requests to the remote host. This figure illustrates the Ansible workflow. As you can see, we have control station and, and we are sending the request to all of the applications, database, or some other things. And uh, you know that in Ansible, we send all requests from a control station station okay this control station can be a laptop a computer a server that is running in the data center okay and after that you know that on this control station we should run the ansible and we should issue the uh, change and request to the remote hosts administrators developers and it managers like the, uh, to use ansible because it allows for easy ramp up for users who aim to create new projects and it sets the stage for long-term automation in uh, initiatives and processes to further benefit their business. Automation by nature reduces the risk of human errors by automatically duplicating known best practices that have been truly tested in an environment. However, automation can be dangerous if it duplicates a bad process or an erroneous configuration. This applies to any tool, not just Ansible. When preparing to automate a task for or set of tasks, it is important to start with the desired outcome of the automation, and then it is possible to move on to creating a plan to achieve the outcome. A methodology commonly used for this process is the PPDI OO, prepare, plan, design, implement, and also observe and optimize. 
lifecycle. Ansible uses playbooks to deploy configuration change or retrieve information from host within a network. An Ansible playbook is a structured set of instructions, much like the playbooks football players use to make different plays on the field during a game. An, an Ansible playbook contains multiple plays and each play contains the task that each player must accomplish in order for the particular play to be successful. Okay, this table describes the components used in Ansible and provides some commonly used examples of, uh, for example, them. Let me to explain a little about this table about the playbook. Okay, description is a set of plays for remote system, and use case is in enforcing configuration and or deployment steps. About the play, a set of tasks applied to a single host or a group of hosts, and use case is grouping a set of hosts to apply policy or configuration to them. And about the task a call to an ansible module logging into a device to issue a show command to retrieve output and also as you can see here we have a playbook and in this playbook uh, as you can see we have one play and also in in this play we have some task actually we have a playbook in this playbook we we can have multiple plays in each play we have some tasks and Sybil playbooks are written using YAML, yet another markup language. And Ansible YAML files usually begin with a series of three dashes and ends with a series of three periods, as you can see here, three dash and end with the three uh, periods. OK, although this structure is optional, it is common. YAML files also contain lists and dictionaries. This example, top example, shows a YAML file that contain a list of musical genres. As you can see, list of music genres, music and then metal, rock, rap and country. YAML lists are very easy to read and consume. As you can see in this example, it is possible to add con comments in YAML by beginning lines with the pound sign, as you can see. OK, as mentioned, earlier a yaml file often begins with three dashes and ends with three periods in addition as you can see in this example each line of a list uh, can start with a dash and a space and indentation makes the yaml file readable all right, YAML uses dictionaries that are similar to JSON dictionaries as they also use key value pairs. Remember from previous videos uh, that uh, a JSON key value pair appears as key column value. A YAML key value pair is similar but does not need to the quotation marks. Key column value. Okay, this example, the bottom example, shows a YAML dictionary containing an employee record. As you can see here, we have three dash and then pound sign HR employee record, employee one column key value, key value. Here we don't have the uh, quotation. Also, list and dictionaries can be used together in YAML. This example shows a dictionary with a list in a single YAML file. As you can see here, we have a three dash and then pound sign HR employee record. After that, employee one, okay, a key value, key value, key value, and then a list skills include the, for example, Python, YAML, and JSON. And here we have the next, uh, for example, dictionary. Again, key value, key value, key value, and also a list that here we have. All right. YAML Lint is a free online tool you can use to check the format of a YAML file to make sure they have valid syntax. Okay, simply go to www.yamlint.com or yamllint.com and paste the content of a YAML file into the interpreter and click go. Lint alerts you if there is an error in the file. Okay, this figure shows the YAML dictionary and list file from previous example in Lint with the formatting cleanup and the comment, uh, for example, removed. And this is the YAML Lint example. Also, Ansible has a CLI tool that can be used to run playbooks or ad hoc CLI commands on target host. This tool has very specific command that you need to use to enable automation. This table shows the most common Ansible CLI command and associated use cases. For example, about the Ansible CLI command, the use case is runs module against targeted host. About the Ansible playbook, runs playbooks. And about the Ansible docs, provide documentation on CLI 
existing tags and parameters in the CLI. About the Ansible pool, this changed Ansible client from the default push model to the pool model. And about the Ansible vault, encrypts YAML file that contain a sensitive data. Also, Ansible uses an inventory file to keep track of the host it manages. The inventory can be a named group of host or a simple list of individual hosts. A host can belong to multiple groups and can be represented by either an IP address or a resolvable DNS name. This example shows the content of a host inventory file with the host 192.168.10.1 in two different groups. As you can see, we have routers, two routers, 192.168.10.10.1, 192.168.20.1. About the switch 192.168.10.25 and 192.168.10.26. And about the primary gateway, 192.168, for example, 10.1. Here, 192.168.10.1 is the, for example, IP address of the router and also the primary gateway. Now, let's take it at some example of Ansible playbooks used to accomplish common tasks. Imagine using a playbook to deploy interface configuration on a device without having to manually configure it. You might take this idea a step further and uses a playbook to configure an interface and deploy an EIGRP routing process. This example shows the content of an Ansible playbook called a configure inter uh, interface.yaml, which you can use to configure the Gigabit Ethernet 2 interface on a CSR1000V router by leveraging the iOS underlying config and Sibyl modules. This playbook adds the following configuration to the Gigabit Ethernet 2 interface on the CSR1000V-1 router description configured by Ansible, IP address 10.1.1.1/24 or subnet mask is 255.255.255.0 and also the no shutdown. As you can see, it starts with 3 dash and then host is CSR1KV-1 gather gather underline facts is false and connection is local about the task the name configure a ether, gigabit ethernet 2 interface ios underline config here we have these lines this list actually description ip as a no shutdown and some other a configuration here you can see the a credential for logging to this device to execute this playbook, the ansible-playbook command is used to call the specific playbook YAML file, configure interface.yaml. This figure shows the output from calling the playbook from the Linux shell. The important things to note in the output are the play, task, and play recap section, which lists the name of the play and each individual task that gets executed in each play. The play recap section shows the status of the playbook that is executed and about the output in this example it can it shows that one play named CSR1KV-1 was launched followed by a task called configure ethernet gigabit ethernet 2 interface based on the status ok equal 1 you know that the change was successful the change 1 status means that a single change was made on CSR 1KV router. Reading out a playbook can greatly simplify a configuration task. This example shows an alternative version of the configure interface that YAML playbook named EIGRP underlying configuration example that YAML with EIGRP added along with the ability to save the configuration by issuing a write memory. These tasks are accomplished by leveraging the iOS underlying command module in Ansible. Okay, This playbook adds the following configuration to the CSR1KV-1 router. First, on Gigabit Ethernet 2, Okay, we have this configuration description configured by Ansible, IP address 10.1.1.1, and the subnet mask is 255.255.255.0, and also no shutdown. And Gigabit Ethernet 3 description configured by Ansible, no IP address, and also shut uh, the no shutdown command. Also, about the global configuration, we have router EIGRP 100. This is the global configuration, EIGRP router ID 1.1.1. .1 .1. That one and no auto summary and then network 10.1.1.0 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Okay, about the safe configuration here we have the write uh, memory command. 
when the playbook is run, the output shows the task is that as they are completed and the status of each one. Based on the output, you can see here in this figure, you can see that tasks with the following names are completed and return the status changed. First, configure Gigabit Ethernet 2 interface, config Gigabit 3, okay, and also config EIGRP 100 as you can see here. Furthermore, the write mem task, okay, uh, completes, which is evident from the status, okay, and uh, okay, CSR one KV dash one, and after that, at the bottom of the output, notice the play recap section, okay, which has the status okay equal four and change equal three. This means that out of the four tasks, three actually modified the rotor and made configuration change and one task saved the configuration after it was modified. Now that the EIGRP underline configuration underline example that the YAML playbook has been run against CSR1KV-1, you need to verify the configuration to make sure it was correctly applied. Example, this example actually shows the relevant section of the startup configuration from CSR1KV-1 to verify that tasks that were applied to the router as you can see we have all of configuration interface gigabit one interface gigabit two gigabit three and also eigrp uh, configuration the last task is uh, in the playbook is to issue the right memory command and you can verify that this happened by issuing show a startup a config command with some filters to see the relevant configuration on the csr1 kv-1 router this figure shows the output from the show a startup config pipe then the section gigabit ethernet 2 include net 3 include router eigrp 300 common as you can see we have all of this configuration interface gigabit ethernet Ethernet 2, interface Gigabit Ethernet 3, and also Rotor EIGRP command. All right, now let me to explain about the next agentless automation tool. We call it Puppet Bolt. Puppet Bolt allow you to leverage the power of Puppet without having to install a Puppet Master or Puppet Agent on device or node. Much like Ansible, Puppet Bolt connects to device by using SSH or WinRM connections. Puppet Bolt is an open source tool that is based on the Ruby language and can be installed as a single package. In Puppet Bolt, tasks can be used for pushing a configuration and for managing services, such as starting and stopping services and deploying applications. Tasks are shareable. For example, users can visit Puppet Forge to find and share tasks with others in the community. Tasks are really good for solving problems that don't fit in the traditional model of client server or Puppet Master and Puppet ma uh, Agent. As mentioned earlier in this video, Puppet is used to ensure configuration on device and can periodically validate that, uh, that the change or a specific value is indeed configured. Puppet Bolt allows you to execute a change or configuration immediately and then validate it. There are two ways to use Puppet Bolt. First, orchestrator driven task and also a standalone task. About the orchestrator driven task, and uh, this can leverage the Puppet architecture to use services to connect to devices. This design is meant for large scale environment. About the standalone task, a standalone tasks are for connecting directly to devices or nodes to execute tasks and do not require any Puppet environment or component to be set up in order to realize the benefit and value of the Puppet Bolt. Individual command can be run from the command line by using the command bolt command run then command name followed by the list of devices to run the a command against okay here as you can see we have bolt sub command action and also we have the options for example bolt command run then the command okay and after that uh, here uh, in addition to manually running the command you can construct scripts that contain multiple command you can construct construct this script in python ruby or any other scripting language then uh, that the device can interpret after a, sc a script is built you can execute it from the command line against the remote device that need to be configured using the command bolt a script run then the script name as you can see here bolt a script run a script 
name followed by the list of devices to run the script against okay and this figure shows a list of some of the available commands for puppet bolt and don't forget the puppet bolt command line is not the cisco command line rather it can be in a linux OS X terminal or Windows operating system. Puppet Enterprise allows for the use of a GUI to execute the, uh, for example, tasks. Also, Puppet Bolt copies the script into a temporary directory on the remote device, execute the script, captures the result, and remove the script from the remote system as if it were never copied there. This is a really clean way of executing remote command without leaving re residual scripts okay, or files on the remote devices, much as in the Cisco DNA Center or Cisco vManage APIs, Puppet Bolt tasks use an API to retrieve data between Puppet Bolt and the remote device. This provides a structure for the data that Puppet Bolt expects to see. Tasks are part of the Puppet modules and use the naming structure, module name, a double colon, task file name. Okay, tasks can be called from the command line much like commands and scripts. You, you can use the command bolt task run and then module name double column a uh, task uh, file name here as here as you can see bold task run and then the task name okay and as i mentioned before the the syntax of the task is the module name and then the task file name let me uh, to write here actually we use bold task run and then this a syntax okay module name double column task file name this naming structure allows the task to be shared with other users on puppet forge a task is a commonly accomplished by a metadata file that is in json format a json metadata file contain information about the task how to run to that the task and any comments okay about how the file is written often the metadata file is named the same as the task script but with a json extension this is a standard way for sharing documentation about what a script can do and how it is structured you can see this documentation by running the command again as you can see bolt task show then the uh, for example module name double column task name in the command line actually now we learn about the a bolt command run then the command bolt script run uh, script bolt task run okay and also you know about the bolt task show after that the uh, for example module name double column task file name all right now let me to explain a little about the salt stack ssh server only mode salt stack offers an agentless option called salt ssh that allows users to run salt command without having to install a minion on the remote device or not this is similar in concept to puppet bolt the main requirement to use the salt ssh are the are that the remote system must have ssh enabled and also a python installed salt ssh connects to a remote system and install a lightweight version of salt stack in a temporary directory and can then optionally delete the, the temporary directory and all files upon completion okay and leaving the remote system clean these temporary directories can be left on the remote system along with any necessary files to run salt ssh this way the files do not have to be reinstalled to the remote device which can be useful when time is a consideration this is often useful on devices that are using salt ssh more frequently than other devices in the environment Another benefit of using salt SSH is that it can work in conjunction with master union environment or it can be used completely agentless across the environment. By default, salt SSH uses roster files to store connections information for any host that doesn't have a minion 
installed. This example, as you can see, shows the content structure of this file. It is easy to interpret the roster file and many other files associated with the salt stash because uh, salt SSH because uh, they are constructed in human readable form. Here we have managed after that host and then the username. One of the major design consideration when using salt SSH is that it is considerably slower than the 0MQ distributed messaging library. However, salt SSH is still often considered faster than logging to the into the system to execute the commands. By automating daily configuration tasks, user can gain some of the following benefits, increased agility, reduced OPEX and streamlined management and finally reduced human error. All right, now let me to compare Chef and Sibel Puppet and Salt Stack with each other. Actually, many organizations face lean IT problems and high turnover, and network engineers are being asked to do more with less. Okay, utilizing some of the tools covered in this video can help alleviate some of the pressure put on IT staff by offloading some of the more tedious, time consuming, and repetitious tasks okay a network operator can then focus more on critical mission responsibilities such as network design and growth planning okay as mentioned earlier in this video a majority of these tools function very similarly to one another this table provides a high level comparison of the tools covered in this video let me to explain a little about them for example as you can see we have puppet chef and Sibyl and salt stack about the architecture puppet master and puppet agent are two important puppet uh, for example um, features and then about the chef we have chef server chef client about the ansible we have control station and remote host about the salt stack we have salt master and salt minions about the language of the a tool a puppet is using puppet domain specific language this is a specific language uh, for puppet about the chef we use Rob, uh, Robby DSL about the Ansible YAML and about the salt stack YAML terminology in puppet we use modules and manifest in chef we use cookbooks and recipes in Ansible we use playbooks and plays and in salt stack we use pillars and grains about the support for large scale deployment all of these tools support the large scale deployment and about the agentless version puppet has puppet bolt chef doesn't have agentless version and ansible has a ansible is uh, agentless and after the salt stack also has the salt ssh that is the agentless version of the salt stack the most important factors in the in choosing a tool are how the tools are used and the skills of the operations staff who are adopting them. For instance, if a team is very fluent in Ruby, it may make sense to look at Chef. On the other hand, if the team is very confident at the command line, Ansible or Salt Stack might be a good fit. The best tool for the job depends on the customer and choosing one requires a true understanding of the differences between the tools and solid knowledge of what the operations team is comfortable with and that will play to their strengths.